There is a lot of different storylines, a lot of ways that we could talk about this game. Alabama and Georgia, we of course gave out our pick on the Friday show. Of course, Chris likes Georgia. I like Alabama. Neither of those, I think, are betting picks. Like, we wouldn't actually put a money say, on use, Using the word like pretty loosely there, but I'll stand by it. Well, that's a, yeah, <laughs> what, what we gave out on the show. How's that? And, and neither of us really like because who can tell? Who has any idea what to expect from this ballgame? We've already seen it once, but, I mean, Georgia, I mean if you've I been think, against Bama and Bama rules, like, you just look like an idiot and you feel like an idiot. But at some point in time, you feel like, well, that story is going to end soon, right? Like, yeah, I mean, it's got to at some point, but it doesn't necessarily have to be this year. So let's uh, let's dive into a couple of different things to talk about with the national championship game. The first one that I do want to bring up: this is the ten year anniversary of the Alabama and LSU rematch down in New Orleans. They played once earlier in the year in the regular season, and then they played again. This was still BCS days before the playoff. But they met again for a national championship, and that matchup begat the college football playoff as it is currently constructed. I am curious if this rematch from a month ago will have similar implications towards the future of this sport. Does this matchup, to you, Chris, does this mean that we are going to get a 12-team playoff, and, and will it specifically happen because this happened this season? Well, I don't know if it was going to specifically happen because of this this season. I think we were on the road to that before the season started. Right, but we okay. had had so many different uh, uh, conference commissioners and presidents and whatnot that yeah, were very standoff morons. Right? No, oh, yeah, they're agreed. all idiots. Okay, <laughs> that, they, that, that you want to look at a bunch of people that vote their own self interest. I'm good. For you, there's massive amount of corruption there. All right, yes. anybody who says more teams is bad for us when you're not being invited to this one. You're obviously corrupt. You're obviously being paid to have that opinion. You don't actually have that opinion. And so (laughs) I don't trust anything that you say or do. And I really love that you are in charge of the honor and integrity of keeping, I don't know, our youth uh, aligned. Like this is, (laughs) this is why I think all these people are phony and they're full of shit. And I don't trust any of them. I hate them all. No, it does make sense. It does make what I'd you're talking about. Their job. Sense. I'd love to have their job. Yes, most certainly. Most. Hey, I think certainly. I'd be substantially better at it than they are. I do tend to agree with that. I I wonder because I we talked about this. I think uh, right after the playoff games, and it was okay. Does this mean that they will finally quit being standoffish and all that good stuff? Because a lot of the standoff part was due to Texas and Oklahoma joining the SEC. At this point, it's okay. Well, if we if we do this, can we find a way to getting more teams into this so that it's not just an SEC invitational every year, right? Now, it did lead to another interesting topic. There was an article in the Washington Examiner, uh, Cam or no, sorry, Con Carroll from the Washington Examiner. Now, this is obviously somebody that does not know a lot about this sport. Of course, suggested. That and and a lot of people are sharing this thing around and whatnot, and and I totally get it. Uh, only one bid per conference into the playoff. Is this something that you think that they will push towards? And of course, the SEC will not allow it. It will never happen. But do you think that something like that would actually be better for the sport? So not one bid, but I actually do think if you cut it off at two per conference, I actually think that that appeases everybody. Because yeah. now you don't have the third best team in the SEC getting in. And and because right now, the way it's constituted, like if we did it this year with the top 12, the SEC gets four teams in, right? Uh, I think only three. Just three? That's yeah, fine. Yeah, Ole Miss like, would be included. but yeah. Okay, so, so like Ole Miss wouldn't have gotten in, and that spot would go to someone else. And, and that's okay. And I think that's – I, I would actually bend on that. Like being the the guy that's from the SEC and my team's in the SEC and, and we've lived this area and we cover it while we know a lot about all of the country and we cover it all. I actually think that's pretty fair. I actually think that's a pretty good compromise is let's get to 12 with the stipulation of I don't care if you're ranked when the season's over with three teams in the top five. That if if you're one, two, and five, five ain't making the playoffs. It just – don't don't come in third in your conference. Yes. 
That's, now, I think that's easy how enough. Do you, how do you get that? As in, let's say we have a situation where we have a one-loss team in the West that doesn't make the, the SEC playoff, and you end up with an undefeated team from the East that loses to the West team. And so now you have two one-loss teams. But, you know, who gets ranked where? That's for the voters. That's for the – maybe the SEC – maybe each conference gets to, to determine that. Like – if you're going to have a pick, the conference gets to say, hey, we think this team is actually more deserving than that, and you get to send one. Um, and and that, that would make very hard job for the commissioner and for people involved, but I, I'm okay with that. I believe it was 2012, or maybe it was 2011. I'm trying to remember. There was the a year. Baylor? No, no, no. It was a oh. year when Alabama, Arkansas, and LSU we're number one, two, and three heading into, yes. I think it was 2011. We're, we're ranked number one, two, and three heading into the, the final weekend of the season. And I, I believe LSU had to beat Arkansas to make it to Atlanta, if I'm not That's right. mistaken. Yes, yes, week 12, November 20th, LSU 11 and Alabama 10 and 1, Arkansas 10 and 1. Alabama had beaten Arkansas, but had lost to LSU. So if Arkansas had beaten LSU that weekend, it's basically just who is the higher ranked team. And then you have to figure – so it does not happen often, but there no, are it doesn't instances. happen often, but we'd have to come up with a solution for that because we've we've had it. This year, we would have had – almost every year, the SEC would have gotten three teams in if you extrapolate it out to what would be 12 based on the rules and what we're talking about. Yes. So you've got to have something for that. But here's the thing. I'm okay with that. I'm 100% okay with that because if you're third in your conference – then I then I'm okay with saying you you just don't get to play for number one in the country. Yeah. Now is that weird to say you can be second in your conference and number one in the country? Uh, I get it, but I'm okay with drawing the line somewhere if it means we get to we get to do this thing. Yes, yes, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, the next but one per conference is ridiculous. That's stupid, and that's drawn up by people who don't follow the sport at all. And that's that's not enough. Like that's just not enough. Yeah, I, t- I tend to agree. Two, I two tend per to conference agree. is a compromise I would make. <laughs> I think I might be alright with that. Uh, I don't know that the SEC will ever okay it, but but it is something to think about. Uh, next question: Will you watch Jimbo Fisher and the Texas A and M staff as part of the college football playoff national title coverage? Because that is who gets to be in the film room this year. It is only Jimbo Fisher and his A and M staff. Is that no, weird to I'm, you? I've never watched those before ever, and I'm and I'm and I don't plan on starting. I I go back and rewatch the film room, and you know I do this. I know every every day after the national title, I go back and listen to what the coaches said and whatnot. I don't think I'm going to do it this year. This seems it, it it's strange to me that they couldn't either get other coaches or they were just interested in Texas A and M and Jimbo Fisher. Like I I don't know what the idea is behind that. Now there are of course there's coaches conferences going on. I believe there's one in Nashville. And there's other things going on around the sport where other coaches may not be able to attend. But I do think it's really strange that they've got Dan Mullen on a bunch of their pregame coverage and whatnot. They couldn't get him in there. They couldn't get somebody else that might be interested in doing this to do it. Like I I, I don't understand why you would only have one guy and his staff talking about this game. Don't know, and I also think that's a really good way to piss off the whole rest of the country. This is already SEC fatigue as it is. Yes. Why in the hell would you just load this thing up? So we're just going to do another SEC coach. Like, I would have rather had one SEC coach and then, you know, four, I mean, literally everybody or no SEC coach at all. Yes. That way you're getting voices from other part of the country to be able to come in and talk about this game. Right. It's somebody from the Big Ten, somebody from the ACC, some, you know, wherever. And hang on, like, why do they have to be superstar coaches? I guarantee you if you were to call some of these smaller, lower-tier coaches, some of these G5 coaches, they would be kicking down the door to get the publicity to, to, to sit in front of a camera for four and a half hours, right. five hours during this game and do it. And guess what? Those guys are really smart. Those guys know their shit. Uh, they they've had David Cutcliffe in the past. They've had Gary Patterson, Mike Gundy. They've had Hugh Freeze. They've had like, once again all, of, all 
all Power Five guys while they were in the Power Five. Well, Hugh, Hugh Freeze, Freeze was, yeah, he was at Liberty, but it, was he at, at the time. Liberty when he did this? Yeah, yeah, I think he did it just last year. Well, then, I, so, so Alex said, I don't watch them. I don't care. But, like, I do understand that if you can't get other, like, the big coaches because they're busy, because they're working, or because they're just on vacation. Like, right now, Lane Kiffin is on, he's on a beach somewhere, and he ain't coming back to do shit like this. While he would be amazing, he's just not doing it unless you just throw him obscene amounts of money. And, and that's okay. But yeah. there's got to be, there's got to be, a hundred coaches, 50 coaches at least at the lower levels that would love the opportunity to let people hear them talk about football and show the country their knowledge of the sport. It's, uh, for example, John Summerall, the new head coach at Troy that was the co-defensive coordinator at Kentucky this past year. Perfect, right? He's a new Troy head coach, and he's played Georgia this year. I mean, what are we talking about? Like it, it stuff yeah. like that would have been perfect, but something, instead, something like that, you know, it, it is. To tell me you couldn't get any of those guys. It's to tell weird. me nobody could pick up the phone and get Bill Clark to come down there, right? Like I would love for the country to get to know Bill Clark better than the country knows Bill Clark because I yeah. worship this man. Now I'm incredibly biased here, but there's not a better football man in the world of Bill Clark. This is not. And I, I would love, I would listen then. I would love to hear him spend four hours talking about this game and these coaches and what's going on here. And Bill Clark played Georgia earlier in the year. Yeah, that, that's mean, what I'm saying. Like, this is a coach that played one of these teams. Like, he, he's got some inside information about it. But also, he's a great football guy from a school that has one of the greatest football stories you could ever have told. Yes. But ESPN refuses to tell it. Uh, it's because just, those it's, guys don't matter. It, it's, they, they don't give a shit. It's, it's mind-numbing. Important. I don't understand why they do it, but alas, it is what it is. We're going to um, puff up Jimbo. That's good. <laughs> and, I, and I like Jimbo. You know that. I yeah. like AM. I like Jimbo. Both of us do. So, so, but I'm still not going to listen. I'm still not gonna, that's not how I want to watch the game. No, of course not. No, I mean, it makes perfect sense. So the next question I've got, uh, everybody that is up there, I've talked to multiple people that are in Indianapolis right now, and it has been freezing rain one of my buddies from down in Birmingham is at the game and he was told leaving one of the bars to be careful out there because he was going back to his hotel and the sidewalks had completely iced over now do we think that Indianapolis is a good city to host uh, a college football playoff title. It's it's done Super Bowls in the past and whatnot. Obviously, it's really good for Final Fours, etc. Indianapolis is a great city. Should college football playoff national title games only be in the cities where you're not expected to get ice and stuff like that? Yeah, but you can't control that because that means that you were going to take Dallas out of there because Dallas just a few yeah. years ago for an NFL playoff game later in January, but it's only like by a week also got iced over in the middle of the thing. It, Atlanta has caught ice this early in the, in the country at different times. So you can't predict the weather. You can't control the weather. And if you're going to make rules like this for things that are rarities, if you can go back and show me that every year, this time in January in, in Indianapolis, they always get this kind of precipitation and cold weather, then, then maybe I'll give it to you. Okay. But I'm going to bet you can't because it's historically right now, colder where we live than it's ever been at this point in time true we've never had temperatures in the 20s where we live in the memphis area this early in january ever true we we, we got snow you know two weeks after a week and a half after christmas we've never gotten snow that early like so if this is an anomaly and and this all of the south is getting this now you're saying you can only put it in New Orleans and Miami and places like that, in like Pasadena. Tampa, yeah, in, in, in Pasadena. Because now you're limit. Because even you, now you've even taken Dallas out of the mix. You've taken Atlanta out of the mix. Like if you're gonna try to do it to Indy, you better damn well know you're doing it to everybody else. Okay, because yes. yes. you can't control the weather. Yeah, you know what you wouldn't do it to though, and, uh, Las Vegas, because <laughs> they announced well, no, uh, last I, I, week. Yeah, Vegas is is hosting. I think in 2025. And, and I, I love, love that. It. Yeah. You know that. But but also, I don't like I'm not gonna shit on this city. If you go out to this place and it's really cold and it's got a lot of participation, and you got two two fan bases from the south that aren't really good at driving on ice, tough shit. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, you're hundred percent right. No, I went to Indy last year for the first time and it was I mean, it's a great city. 
I what are we going to do when we go to 12 and we don't do bowl games for the first round and somebody's got to go to South Bend? Oh, yeah. Somebody's got to go. Somebody's got to go up to Michigan or Ohio State sometime. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. Heaven forbid Boston College makes one. Wisconsin. Or, or Washington. At you Wisconsin, know? Minnesota. Wisconsin, like, you know, what are you going to do then? You're just going to not go? No. <laughs> no, you're going to pack your shit and you're going to go. Yeah, you got to make it work one way or the other. All right. Uh, uh, after that, <clears throat> let's see. I did want to bring up, now that the NFL has 18 weeks, they are now not doing playoff games on the week that the college football playoff national title game happens. Is there a chance, you think, heading into the future stuff, that once they do the renegotiations for uh, whether we expand or whatever, do you think we can finally get this thing on a Saturday night instead of a Monday? Well, they're still playing games on Saturday, though. They are. There'll just be regular season games that it'll go up against. Right. but that. So what I'm saying is, could they... Could they convince the NFL, which I doubt they convinced the NFL. The NFL moves for nobody. That's kind of what I'm thinking. That's, that's the only, because ESPN owns this thing right now. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if they get Fox involved, and ES, they get NBC, and ES, et cetera. And ESPN also is the one that Doing has the Saturday, the Saturday games. Had the Saturday games. Yes. So if they do that, the only way we could get that Saturday national title game will be if Fox or somebody else is to bid on it and they win it, and they can do well, what they here, want. And, no, and here's the thing. I mean, Rook, asking the NFL to help you out a little bit, you know, maybe if you throw them some money, you could figure something out. Uh, but but here's the thing. The NFL games are 3.30 and was like 7 o'clock Saturday. But convince the NFL to treat it just like Sunday and play at noon and 3.30, and now you've got your nighttime uh, championship game. And you got a good lead in. Because everybody yeah. watches the NFL. If, I, if, I'm the, if I'm the NFL, I would at least listen to this and hear them out. But also, I mean, you know, listen, don't nobody give nothing away for free. Okay? No, you're 100% right. But also, me- also, this does work well with the NFL with their broadcast partners, right? If, if they are willing to work with their broadcast partners, yes, that's how it might work out. Uh, well, that's it. That's it. If you're, if you're Fox and you're NBC and you're CBS and, and you're ESPN and you're going to rotate getting this game, then, then you got to give me a piece of the pie when we're negotiating our deal. I, I like it. I but like it, it wouldn't be hard because they just play two games. And so you just play one at noon, one at 3.30, just like every Sunday, noon games, 3.30 games. And then, and then you're done for the lead up for basically Sunday night football. Sunday night football would now be the championship game. I like it. I'm, I'm good with that. I'm totally good with that. But the, uh, the NFL is not going to do it for nothing. No, of course and not. No, and here's the thing, and I don't know that I think they should. Like, you know. No, it's all, it, everything's negotiable, right? That's right. Everything's negotiable. Finally, the last thing that I want to bring up about the game, this one actually has to do with the game, and that is, what will a win or a loss mean for Kirby Smart? Now, I've got uh, I've got some ideas and whatnot, but I'll, I'll let you have the floor first. I don't think a loss means anything. I mean, a guy that's bullied you and beaten you your entire career so far, it, it, you know, it, it just bullied you and beat you again. Like there's, I don't, I don't think that matters or means anything. It didn't change anything for him. Right. At some point in time, would it one day convince all these kids that are going to Georgia that no matter what kind of talent we have here, we're always going to lose those other guys. So why keep picking Georgia? Like other people have beaten him, but Georgia hasn't. So why are we trusting it in Kirby? That could be the only thing, but even then, I don't, I don't think that's a real possibility, but I don't think it matters. A win, however, changes everything because yes. they they have been the only team to to, to beat uh, uh, Alabama in recruiting the last couple of years. They're the only school that has gotten a number one recruiting class over Alabama ever in the last like five years. So that it it solidifies him and and it puts him in a place where you know it's been forty years since. You know, Georgia's won a championship. Everybody else almost in the SEC has had their turn, especially all the big boy programs have, have all kind of rotated through there and, and, and all gotten, gotten their rings in that, in that, you know, 40 year span. And, and they're the one big boy left, you know, wanting. Right. So I, I think it changes a lot for him. So 
A lot of the uh, the powerhouse programs just in the southeast, right? Clemson, Miami, Florida State, et cetera, they have all had theirs. Well, I mean, hell, it, you're talking about we're yeah. going 40 years. You're talking Georgia Tech's had theirs. Yeah, like, yeah, Georgia Tech in 1990. We're not talking – we're not just talking LSU, Auburn, you know, you know, Bama, uh, Tennessee, those teams. We're, we're talking teams that are in your state that are significantly smaller than you. Now, that was a long, long time ago, but still. Yeah, I mean, it was just nine years after. Since you've last last won, they've won. Yes. And there's no reason for that. (laughs) No, you're 100% right. Auburn, LSU, Florida, Tennessee. I mean, you keep naming it, and And, and yes. And and Tennessee, Florida, and Auburn are got to be the three that stick in your craw because those are your biggest rivals as a team. We can say Georgia Tech is an in-state rival, but they don't play in your conference. It ain't the same since they've left the SEC SEC years ago. Even still, that means all four of Georgia's biggest rivals. All four of your rivals. Not including Alabama, which I think is a a more modern-day rivalry, right? But that's not a rivalry. That's just not a rivalry. You can't can't just say we're the two best teams, and so now we're a rival. Like That's just not – it has to be more than that. You play those other four teams every year. That matters. I don't believe that a loss means anything for Kirby. All all it will mean is there are – the people that support that program will continue – to doubt him. And that's it. Uh, at the end of the day, Nick Saban is over 70 years old. He will eventually retire. People yep. do not live forever. At Joe Paterno and Bobby Bowden are the only ones that have coached into their 80s, and those two fell off towards the end, right? That, well, they stopped coaching well into their 80s. Like, yeah. Jimbo Fisher was the coach that ran everything at Florida State for I don't know, seven years, nah, like, six years. Nah, it wasn't. It wasn't that long. It was four ish somewhere around okay. there before he All took right. over. Yeah. But it was a it was a significant amount of time before you know that Bobby was just a face. Yes, like like him and Joe Pa weren't X's and O in it. Okay, they were <laughs> racking up stats. Yes, one hundred percent. They were racking up wins, and Nick Saban is still doing the X's and O's. He is still recruiting he's he's doing everything at a high level oh, to yeah. this day and well, eventually well there's a big difference between 70 and 85 Gary. oh agreed 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 i mean there's a substantial and, difference but, but that's that. what i'm saying is eventually like kirby smart is incredibly young right he is still 10 years younger today than nick saban was when he started at alabama so this, he's got a long long career ahead of him uh, but this is if you were ever going to catch Alabama, this would be the year to do it. Uh, they are the worst version of a Nick Saban team that they have had there in in many many years. They are incredibly yeah. young. It's so. there's a reason Georgia was a huge favorite going into the SEC title game because we had 12 games of data from both these teams, and Alabama looked worse than Alabama's ever looked, and and Georgia looked better than Georgia's ever looked. Yes, and and and. And there's a reason now you give Nick, you know, a, a, an extra week and, and all this time. I, I don't know. I can't, exp- I can't explain. I can't explain the national title game because it's uh, the SEC title game. Yeah. The <laughs> SEC title game because it didn't match anything. It didn't match anything that we've seen for 12 weeks. I, I will tell you. So this will play into, into the next, you know, the last question regarding this game. Uh, what does it mean for college football overall? And I think what it means is this is just another data point that you have to have that NFL superstar quarterback to be able to win a national title. If Alabama uh, wins and Georgia loses, I think that's what that means because I'm going to disagree with that right now. Okay, just I, I would love I would love to hear your reasoning behind it. Well, because if 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 Stetson Bennett plays fine. And this is a low scoring defensive slog, but but you know, either both quarterbacks look bad or both quarterbacks look good, that and, and, and George ends up losing this game, then then that doesn't mean they didn't have that NFL quarterback, so they can't win. Like I just I just refuse to believe that because I just I I think this Georgia team is really, really good. Okay, I, I, and I agree. Think they you. can win in spite of him. Here's the thing: if Georgia wins, then then what you just said gets definitively crushed, right? Because there's right. no way on earth Stetson Bennett is a big time NFL quarterback. Uh, correct, that, and that's what I'm saying is that is the the narrative coming out of this. If Kirby Smart and that massive that defensive might be a, front, that whatnot, might be a narrative, loses. but it's not true. It's not accurate. It's not right. You don't have to have that guy. 
And also, remember, Alabama had that guy, and that guy hasn't translated into the NFL really good to be that superstar NFL quarterback yet. Agreed. Agreed. He, so, he is a, so let's so, be real careful about that. They, those guys get drafted early a lot, and, and, then they, and then they're fair to middling. Okay. Right. So what? So what does that mean? Do you think that there is? It, it, so so basically, we don't know that they translate necessarily, right? Uh, Tua has had flashes of brilliance in Miami, but he's also faltered a little bit. Mac Jones, no, no, kind of no, same no, thing. Don't, don't gloss over that. You can't say he's had flashes of brilliance and then faltered a little. He's been the definition of mediocre in the NFL. Right. Would you say the same thing about uh, Jalen Hurts? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I'd say the same thing. Uh, would you say the same thing about Mac Jones right now? Absolutely. Okay. Now, there are a ton. The definition of mediocre uh, between all of them. There are a ton of and NFL scouts. And there was scouts. a decade between them and, like, A.J. McCarron, which was the last Alabama guy that came out that, that got an right, NFL right, right. job for a long time, and he wasn't worth a shit. <laughs> I'm saying that this is a, a recent trend, right? If you go back through... Yeah, take the, Alabama quarterbacks and your quarterback will be mediocre. Well, the, the <laughs> That's not what I'm getting at. Take, 20, take an LSU quarterback. We've, we, we don't have many. We got one, but he's pretty much a superstar. Right, that's what I'm saying. Like, so 2020, you had Mac Jones win a national title, right? And he, yeah. first round, he's now taking the Pats to the playoff. Obviously, that's not yeah, Mac Jones. he didn't but, take the pass to the playoffs. It, right, agreed. I, I'm saying that he is the starting quarterback of a playoff team. Right, okay. I'm not saying Jaylen that he's Hurts good. Is the starting quarterback of a playoff team, too. <laughs> I'm saying he was a first round NFL quarterback. If he wasn't a good NFL, if he wasn't, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If he wasn't expected to be a good NFL quarterback, they wouldn't have taken him in the first round, right? Yes, they would have uh, because he played at Alabama. I don't know that I buy it. The last, okay. the last NFL well, we've quarterback. Got, well, we've got we've got three in the NFL right now. Okay, and in five years, we'll see how many we still have. This is this was not supposed to get into an Alabama know, quarterback but, debate. But, but what I'm saying, but you think you think that because these guys are stars in college, it equates to being stars in the pros, and it just doesn't. No, and no, you I, think you have to have this star? A quarterback is the most important position in football. Yes. Okay. So yes. The team that has the better quarterback, if you have a star quarterback and the other team doesn't, then the other team is at a significant disadvantage. But it doesn't mean that team can't beat you. Zach Calzada led AM team beat Alabama. Correct. And he like was completely like inept the entire second half because of an injury. Okay. Came out of several series. Yeah. And then had to Until drag the last his ass two back and, in yeah. injured to come back. Okay, so you're talking about a very mediocre quarterback in college can beat somebody. Agreed, a hundred percent. Is it hard? Yes, but this fucking I, hard. It's hard to yes, win. Yes, it's very hard. I'm I'm looking at the last however many national title winning quarterbacks. Right, 2020 Mac Jones, 2019 was Joe Burrow, 2018 was Trevor Lawrence, 2017 uh, basically two uh, because Jalen Hurts didn't do anything in that first half. 2016 Deshaun Watson. Now, 2015 was Jake Coker, and that was the last one that did not, he was not expected to be a big time NFL quarterback, right? Well, he the, wasn't the highly is, ranked. Is all those guys are expected to be, and one of them, Deshaun Watson, has proven that he is definitively a star if he can ever get back on the field. He may be the and next I think, Dolphins. And I, think, and I think Joe is going to be a star, and I think the rest of those guys are just dudes. And the, there's a chance that they play in really stable systems, and so they'll probably have long careers, but I don't know if they're ever going to be great. Yeah. I, think, I think what we saw from Mac Jones this year is what we're going to see. Yeah. Like, I don't, no, I don't know how much better he's getting. I don't know, I don't know how much better Tua's going to get. Like, Tua has flashes of brilliance, and he gives the ball to the other team all the time. So. Yeah. No, you're uh, you're not wrong about that. And he holds it too long, so he gets sacked in the NFL a lot, which is going to mean he's going to have a hard time getting healthy or staying healthy. And then people are going to say, well, if he just would have been healthy, he could have been a lot better. Well, that's just not true. <laughs> it's like, are we sure about that? Are we sure about that? So, no, you're right. You're right. It's, um, the most important, it's, a, it's a really important position. And does, if uh, you've got a better quarterback, then it's easier for you to win. Does an Alabama win mean anything different than – what it already has going forward. No, I don't no. think it does. If you have if you have all the best players and you have all the best coaches, then you're going to beat everybody all the time. That's kind of what it seems. Kirby like. Smart has equal best players, except for at the most important position. Overall talent, he doesn't have the three best players. 
I would think the three, if you were drafting the players, and I'm just doing this from the top of my head, Alabama's got number one, number two, number three draft pick. The next 12 might be Georgia's, but it doesn't matter. And then all the best coaches are on the Alabama sideline. I mean, you got NFL playoff winning coaches. Now I'm yeah. not talking about NFL scrubs that got fired. All right. These guys, your OC got fired because he was a shitty GM. All right. Yeah. Not, not because he was a bad coach. He was one of the best coaches. Hey, by the way, let me all the NFL. Let me let me hijack that conversation right quick. Uh, Bill O'Brien, of course, it's uh, been reported that he is going to interview for the Jaguars' head coaching job. His best friend is Doug Marone. You think he brings Doug Marone back as like a an offensive line coach or an OC or something with him to the Jags? I don't. I don't know that he couldn't. I think that Doug Marone probably has a decent relationship with that family and it's not the same GM I, I think that fired him you know it, I think all relationships could be mended I also think that it could be a thing where the Jags hire him and say we don't want Doug back and you say all right yeah Doug you now are going to be the OC at Alabama yeah. and that's what's going to happen more than likely more than likely so we shall see. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.